This webinar is a follow-up to a webinar we did um, some months back entitled The Many-to-Many -many Classroom. This second one is going to focus on a more specific approach to that concept and specifically talk about what we believe are five key steps towards the production of better instructor-led training. So my thanks again to all of you for joining. Um, throughout the webinar, which will be a short one today, I'm imagining about 20 minutes and, and, and maybe 30 minutes including questions and answers, there is a chat box there in the, in the chat window. If anybody have any questions for myself or for John or Brian, please feel free to type them in and uh, we'll have a Q&A session towards the end. So without further ado, I'll begin. So there's a quote up here on screen, one of my favorites when it comes to the subject of learning. I'm always ready to learn, although I do not always like being taught. Um, I was wondering if anybody, while you were sitting there, had an opportunity to figure out who that was that originally said that. And the original speaker was, of course, Winston Churchill. Um, he said this during the Second World War um, uh, at, uh, in one of his memoirs, a wonderful quote. And it, it's, it's a quote which I like a great deal because it's... It, it nicely encapsulates um, a lot of my attitude towards the design of training materials. Um, and another quote which I thought I'd, I'd, I'd just put up here on screen for a moment comes from another one of my favorite writers, a more recent writer, a guy called Clay Shirky, from a book called Here Comes Everybody. And he said, human beings are social creatures, not occasionally or by accident, but always. Um, Clay Shirky is the guy who actually kind of gave us the concept of the many-to-many -many broadcast model. His book, Here Comes Everybody, is really an exploration um, of social media, and he talks about how if we kind of trace the evolution of media and broadcast through the 20th century, what we would see if we were to plot it on a graph is an inevitable or kind of inexorable line away from what he calls the one-to-many broadcast model, the wireless radio, the TV, the cinema, towards what he calls a many-to-many -many broadcast model. And it could be argued, and has been argued persuasively by some, that our classrooms, our training materials, need to reflect that change as well. And that's where our concept of what we call the many-to-many -many classroom comes from. So what I wanted to do today was to follow on to the, from the webinar we did a few months ago and start talking about some more specifics and to show you a couple of cool new tools we've been playing with to kind of implement this idea of the many-to-many -many classroom. So, what I want to do is talk about five steps towards what we believe can be better ILT. They're not the only five steps in the world. Um, you may have others. I, I'd encourage you to type other ideas into the chat window or ask questions, as I said. But we thought these would be a good five to start with. So the first of which is a very obvious one. Make it interactive. And there's specifically something there we want to explore about the 80-20 rule. Some of you may have heard of Pareto's principle. And uh, Clay Shirky talks about this in his book about the 80-20 rule of interactivity as well. Um, then we, a second issue for making instructor-led materials uh, or classroom materials better is, is, is an issue we focused on recently, which is about aligning the brand. Now I'll go on to explain what that actually means in a few minutes. Number three, make it useful. Such an obvious statement, I understand it may even provoke laughter. But um, it's something which unbelievably gets forgotten quite a great deal. And I'll show you some examples of what I really mean by that in a few minutes. Fourth, extend the classroom. Um, an instructor-led training session, I th often think, is as successful as what happens beforehand and what happens afterwards, not just what happens in the classroom. And then fifth, and finally, let's apply it to the job. So I'll start by talking a little bit about the first one, about making it interactive. So underlying this concept of making it inter interactive um, is our instructional approach, which is this many-to-many -many model of communication, not a one-to-many model of communication. And from this comes the 80 to 20 rules of interaction. For those of you not familiar with Pareto's principle or the 80-20 rule, one very simple example of it is that some people suggest that 80% of your profits will come for 20% of your products. So a shoe salesman at any given time will be making 80% of his money and 20% of the stock that he's selling. Um, how does this relate to education? Well, historically in the past, let's say at the beginning of the, 19th, of the, beginning of the 20th century rather, 
the standard model of education was the expert at the top of the classroom broadcasting to 30 or 35 very obedient school children who would sit there and meticulously jot down everything that this expert at the top of the classroom says. It's still the basis of our lecture structure that we have at most universities. Now, over 150, or some people would say 2,000 years of research has shown that this is actually not a particularly effective method of instruction, yet it seems that our universities and indeed our corporate training spaces are, are totally and utterly wedded to this concept of, of the expert at the top, that 80% of the broadcast comes from the expert at the top, and if you're lucky, 20% of the time is spent with the student actually speaking or interacting or getting to, to ask a question. What we suggested in our previous webinar was that we would like to flip those numbers, actually invert them entirely to be around to 2080. Now, will we actually ever get to that? I'm not quite so sure. But if we could set ourselves the lofty goal, we might just get ourselves to 50-50. So what does this look like in practicality? What we're really talking about is keeping the learner active, not passive. They're not empty vessels to be filled with information. They do, of course, bring their own experiences to the classroom, to the learning experience. They bring their own prior learning, what books they've read, what culture they come from, what language is their first language, what TV shows they watch. Their understanding and experiences of what it means to actually learn something, their own preferences for how they learn. And whatever all those things are, one thing we can say with certainty is that we should try to keep the learner active, not passive. And a favorite expression of mine, um, a guy called David Merrill said a few years ago, information is not instruction. One of the most profound expressions I've ever heard about learning. Um, we can't just bark information at learners. We have to make them do something. And I'm fond of saying myself, to do is to learn. I'm often fond of the idea that what, what helps learners learn is to get them to do something, cognitive processing, make the learner produce, make the learner perform. Now, what exactly that performance looks like can vary from class to class, from trainer to trainer, from subject to subject, from learner to learner. But crucially, a learner should be active and not passive. So, how have we tried to make this happen? Since our last webinar, which I think a few of you attended, we have developed a new tool to be used in the classroom, not an iPad or a tablet device that you see in front of you, but rather something that can be used on a tablet or can be used on a laptop. And this is um, a thing we're, we've, we're finding ourselves calling the interactive media book. Technically speaking, it's a PDF with embedded media which the learner can write into, can watch video in, can listen to audio in, and can crucially annotate and save locally to keep as a version for themselves. Those of you who will have attended our last session on ILT, we, we might remember that we talked an awful lot about the need for classroom materials, um, participant guides, to be living, breathing documents that you take with you. Many of you will know this. You, you'll recall that you've gone to a training session, and you know a week, two weeks, three weeks later, you can't remember exactly what the facilitator said. So what do you do? You dig out the slide deck you were given. Maybe you've written notes on it. We wanted to take this idea a step further and give people a living, breathing document which they could use a month, a year later after the session, but which also contains embedded media which they could then use. So what I'll try and do now is uh, show you one we made earlier. So I'm just going to open this up. And uh, this is the bit where I hope technology doesn't fail me. OK, so this is our interactive PDF. Um, what you should be seeing here is you'll see a name and supervisor and date tag. Now note that as soon as I click in here, it's going to ask me to sign in. I'll click close for the moment, but the idea there is that you save a local copy to your desktop on your machine. So I'll just show you. I can, I can, tape, I can type in my name in here. Uh, my supervisor is, oh, let's call him Matt. Then I can add the date in there later on below. The interactive media book that I'm showing you here is a generic version just with interactive services branding on it, but it'll give you an idea of some of the kind of interactivities you can introduce into the classroom onto a person's tablet or onto their laptop. So we've got some tabs running down the side here which we can use for navigation. Some of these media books can, can run to the hundreds of pages. Um, so we try to break them up into sections and use navigation quick clicks on the side to get you through. Um, we like our participant guides in the classroom, these interactive media books, to welcome you. We like the, the branding to be friendly. Um, and then we also have a slide always near the start where we talk a little bit about, um, we want to show the learner visually what the structure of the course or the session looks like. So you can see here we've got some strong iconic branding, 
um, which explains the instructional approach. We want this to be, you know, kind of immediately visually evident to the learner how they're going to spend their time, what kind of activities they're going to do. They can kind of see that these activities are participatory to a large degree. Um, then moving on, also, yeah, we want to give the session guide at a glance. So this might be a sample one here. You'd have an introduction and the topics, a test perhaps in the middle, a break somewhere maybe might be in there. Um, and again, we, these session guides, these um, overviews can look different from, from project to project, from client to client. Um, then, as I said, we, we want to use a lot of audio for a lot of times in uh, the clients we deal with. We, have, we deal with uh, wonderful experts within the organizations. So what we can do is re record some audio with an individual, our friend Bill here. You can click on the, um, I won't be able to play anything for you here because this is just a dummy at the moment and uh, the audio wouldn't broadcast through my microphone. But we'll be able to click on Bill, hear an audio interview from him, and then reflect and debrief on, in our column here on what Bill had said. We can follow that up then with an activity. So for example, we have a conversation here between Bill and his colleague Linda, and then we can ask the learner to input some sample materials into this space here, and that then gets saved to the learner's local version. So we can set out a structure for them, say, look, here are things to listen to, ideas to listen out for, activities to do, people you need to contact. Then moving on to show you another one. This is another one we call the fill in the, uh, fill in the blanks activity. Again, you could listen to Bill here, a little bit like the old language lessons you used to get in school, listen to the two guys ordering ca uh, coffee. Um, fill in the blanks as you listen to the conversation. It's a focusing activity. Um, text entry activities, you've seen kind of these, but we can pose questions. And again, the text entry is very simple. You can save all that, keep it directly on your machine. Some different varieties of those uh, text entries. We can lay these out pretty much in any kind of shape or form. I won't bother typing into those. You get the gist by now. Drop downs are nice too. If you want to give somebody a multiple choice uh, uh, suggestion, you want to get somebody to think about different possibilities. Then we have a fundamentals checker, what we might call a click to reveal. Um, we can ask somebody a question here on the left hand side and then using this button here, click to a slide or at the back of the interactive media book which reveals the correct answers. It's kind of a back of the answers at the back of the book feature, you might call it. Uh, quite nice actually. Video slides, we can embed videos in. Um, Videos we, uh, we could be of your experts talking within the office space, or it could be rehearsals of scenarios. Again, it depends on the client and depends on the content. And as to say, this is an example. You know, I can go on and go on. We got a video here with a question and drop down. I think at this point you probably get the general gist of how the interactive media book works. What I'll do now is jump back to the PowerPoint slide and, and progress on to talk about some of the other. Um, aspects we talked about for the good ILT. And I'll explain a little bit about how we could have been using those interactive media books to, uh, to make these five things happen. So I, I said our second one was about aligning the brand. So what do we mean by aligning the brand? Um, we want to approach our instructor-led training materials in the same way as we would a piece of courseware or a learning game, the staple of what our company does. So that means greater media attention and development. And uh, a, a particularly a consideration of the client's brand, and not just the client's brand, but also the project's brand. What's the learning need here? Who's the audience? What are we trying to teach? And aligning the visuals and the language that we use to that need. So we look at the client's voice, and we apply that voice to the writing, to the visuals, and crucially to the instructional design approach. So this means that we might take a very formal approach for one particular audience or subject matter, and maybe a very informal approach for a different audience. It's usually a bit of a mix of all of the above. And crucially, the classroom materials, we believe that the learners respond very well to classroom materials that feel considered and tailored for them and for their session, not just a kind of generic off-the-shelf, you know, cookie-cutter kind of approach to classroom training. So what do we mean? Let's look at a couple of examples. So we, um, this is a sample of a, a media book we did around um, the role of the chief restructuring officer for a client. And uh, one of the themes that came up during our early conversations was that this particular role, some people saw them as explorers, kind of pathfinders. So we took this a bit literally in one of these early concepts and, and said, well, you know, what would that look like? So we've gone for what you might call, I suppose you'd say, the, in, the, Indi the Indiana Jones theme. And um, 
I'll show you what some examples that look like on the next slide. You can see the kind of iconography and kind of sepia tinted thing we've used. And again, the, the icons I showed you earlier on about what the, what the different activities look like. We've aligned these here to, uh, to that Indiana Jones theme. So then another example here, something a little bit more modern. Again, sticking with the explorer and mapping kind of theme, though, but again, very, very different. Um, very clean, very minimal kind of look. Again, the icons again, but what I'm saying here, what you're seeing here is how each one has been aligned to a very different look and feel based on research and understanding about that audience and about an understanding of what that content is. So what's our third step? Make it useful. Now, what do I mean by make it useful? Of course, learning should be useful. But oftentimes, I think in the past, particularly in uh, not just in classroom training, but in e-learning as well, there's been a slight tendency to kind of hide the instructional design. And living in the age we now live in, where, where our learners are increasingly time poor, and they're oftentimes quite rightly thinking, well, look, why, why am I sitting in this classroom session? Why am, I, why am I spending these three hours in here? And one of the things we've tried to do in our design is to make the design and the instructional design self-evidently useful to the learner. And what do I mean by that? Well, let me show you a quick example. You've seen us do these icons. I've shown you some examples here, the Indiana Jones ones and so on. But here's another example for um, a generic approach we often take. Many of you will be familiar with an instructional design approach, which is um, learn it, apply it, excuse me, learn it, practice, and learn, practice, apply. This is another extended version of that, whereby the learn it might be in the classroom, where the facilitator shows a 60 second video to the classroom, or where in the interactive media book the learner watches a video or perhaps explores an audio conversation, or maybe it's some kind of actual didactic, that broadcast part that we talked about. And then crucially, we move into the other larger part, which is where we get the learner to work it. Now, what do we mean by this? It could be the exploration of a scenario, a role play, an activity. Maybe you've got to write an email, work out a plan of some kind. Actually, work your way through. So earlier on, I referred to the whole idea of making the learner produce, making the learner perform. That, to me, is the meat in the middle of the sandwich. And then we have the own it. Personalize this activity to you. What does this mean to me in my particular corner of the office, in my part of the world? How do I own this and make it mine? And then finally, crucially, you apply it. You bring it, you ask yourself or ask the learner to ask themselves, how do we bring this back to the shop floor? How do we bring this back to the workplace? How do I make this work tomorrow? So this could look something like an action plan. What, tell me five things you're going to do differently next week that you didn't do last week. Something which is even more powerful, as I say, if we can get that to extend that and bring it to the, back to the, to the job. And what I like about this design, the visuals of this design, not just the, the names of these, is that it explains this stuff. There's an old joke for those of us in Europe or in the UK. It does exactly what it says on the tin, a famous slogan from an advertising campaign in the UK that's been running for 25 years. A product that explains itself. So the time poor learner, the learner who's thinking, why am I here? What's this got to do with me? Looks at this and goes, all right. I'm going to spend an hour doing this, I'm going to learn it, I'm going to work it, oh, I'm going to own it, okay, right, apply it. You may not understand the exact nuances of this, but it's, it's quite kind of obvious and self-explanatory. And also, it's quite grown up, it has a kind of mature approach to it. So we're trying where possible, and this is one example, to make the instructional design self-evident, to make it useful so the learner understands why they're here. Um, and here we've got some examples that applied into the interactive PDF. You can see the learn it icons creeping in there. Then we've got a work it icon here. This is a, a dummy example where you'd, you'd look at an image of something and figure out should it be condition A or condition B. And again, you check your answers at the back of the book. Then uh, onus would be um, asking yourself sort of reflective questions about yourself and how do you fit in. And then this also extends not just um, into the participant guides, but also into the PowerPoint slides that the learner would see in the classroom. So again, we, we, we've got our learn it icon here up in the top left. We've taken a very bold kind of visual approach, a highly sort of informational, almost infographic approach to things. And again, reflecting that age we're living in where the learner is time poor and wants the facts in a sharp, snappy fashion. We have tried to take an approach in this instance here, which is very much around the information. Tell me the facts. Tell me what I need to know. Give it to me quickly. That kind of approach. So, uh, oh yes, and there is a facilitator guide sample here. That's what the two pages of the FT might look like for the facilitator. So moving on, 
Point five, ex or point four, excuse me, extend the classroom. So, one of the things I talked about earlier on is that I, I think classroom time can often be best used or, or, or maximized when the learner is coming in the door having done some pre-work for the classroom. And the interactive media books really allow us to do this wonderfully because it, perhaps the learner has downloaded it to their tablet or their laptop, they've received it, I don't know, let's say they're coming to the classroom session on the Monday, we send it out to them on the Friday and we say, look, open it up, sign in your name, save a local version, and do activity one. So the practice activity could be, for example, that we get someone to listen to an audio story, write some notes in, and that audio story would tick off or open up the box, as it were, to several of the key and core issues they're going to be explored on day one coming in the classroom. So the learner's coming in the door primed to have certain questions answered for them. That's what I mean by extending the classroom. Similarly, and perhaps even more powerfully, um, and nobody, most people don't like the word homework, but why not set some after class activities? Day one of the classroom is over. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow morning for day two. But please, this evening, as you're networking with your colleagues, take five minutes and do practice activity three. All you've got to do is listen to an audio story, type some notes in, and we'll pick this up tomorrow morning. You're building a mental bridge for the learner between days one and days two. You're giving them that opportunity to, to think about this stuff in a soft way during the evening time, so that they're not just walking at the door having thrown it away. You're building that bridge for them, as I say, extending the classroom. And getting them, to, giving them the kind of soft opportunity to process that while they're possibly not even thinking about it too hard. And there you go. You can see uh, we would have said, "Here's a quiz. You know, you've listened to the audio. Type some activities in. Tell us what you think. Bring it into the classroom the next day." Uh, point five: Apply it to the job. Can't understate or overstate the importance of this. How many of you have gone to training sessions where you thought, God, this is such a good training session, I'm learning so much here, and yet a week to two weeks later, 60, 70, 80 percent of everything you learn, no matter how good that facilitator is lost. Why? Because we don't apply it to the job. So what we would like to suggest is that, we, again, using the interactive media book, you have a final assessment. In this particular theme, we'd had a sports theme, so we call this one the post-game activity. I think in the previous one it was called pre-game. And, and this to me is very simply can look at like something like an action plan. Now you've finished, what are you going to do differently? How are you going to bring it to the job? Take 10 minutes to identify five things you're going to do differently in the first month, and then five things you're going to do differently six months from now. And then we've kind of snuck in a sneaky thing here saying, you'll have to present this plan to your leader, slash manager, slash boss, so think carefully. Ideally, what would happen here is that we have an agreement uh, with, whereby the learner takes this interactive media book to their leader or manager a week after they've done the classroom session. And they would then, in a sort of maybe kind of informal session on the job, as it were, explore what those five things are they're going to do differently this month. And then briefly cover what they'll be doing differently in six months. And crucially, six months later, a good, a good leader and a good manager will set a little alert with that staff member to open this back up again and have a look and see, did we do those five things we said we'd do in the first month? Okay, now that it's six months in, are we able to do these six things? Actually, now that we're six months in, do we need to do five totally different things? The crucial thing is that we're following up. We're applying it to the job. Now, this is just one sample, um, one example of how we could do this. As I've been talking, perhaps other examples have presented themselves to you as, you as you've been listening to me talk. I'd certainly be curious to hear any other ideas. So there we are. There are five ideas about how to extend the classroom, apply it to the job, make it useful, and uh, all those other good stuff that we saw.